let's first talk about picking the right recipe for your bean because I think that's something everyone has to worry about. So for the longest time with the decent espresso machine, I only thought about making what I would call the lever shot, which is a shot that rises in pressure and takes about 30 seconds to, to run. And it looks like um, the espressos that you're used to in cafes. Uh, it comes historically from machines with levers that would do this. And I think the geniuses who built those first espresso machines uh, tinkered a lot with the tubing and the hardware to come up with something that made good coffee with the bean style that they had in Italy. So when you're making espresso, what you're doing is you're extracting material from beans. And uh, the main measure of how easy the coffee comes out of the beans is a term called solubility. Solubility is the ability for water to take materials out. And the more you roast a bean, the more you take those carbohydrates and the cellulose, sorry, and the more you take the cellulose and the more you break it up, the more you expose the stuff, the flavor stuff that's on the cellulose to water. And uh, it's very much like if you took a steak and you put it in water, nothing comes really into the water. You burn the hell out of that steak, you put it in water, suddenly it gets quite dark, right? The more you roast something, the more it becomes easily liberated into water. Uh, and the, uh, the traditional bean from Italy has been one that's been what I would call medium to dark. And it's one that liberates fairly easily to water. Uh, it's, it's the reason that you can have in Italy espressos that use only seven grams of coffee um, to 14 grams. Those are the traditional doses there because the beans are usually quite roasted. And so they give up their water, they give up the flavor quite easily. And um, that results in cost savings on the machine, uh, cost savings, sorry, cost savings on the staff. Uh, because they can make the coffees faster, less money for the coffee as well. And it's kept the price down to about one euro in Italy for those coffees. Those are medium roast coffees and you generally a 30 second shot seems to work best for them. That's the, the engineering. Now, if you get beans that are less roasted, which means that they are dark in color, sorry, Sorry, it's the morning. Less roasted means lighter in color. Um, then they're gonna be less soluble. They're gonna give up the material less easily to water. So if you take a bean that's quite light, I have a handy color chart here. So imagine a lighter bean instead of a darker bean. That same 30 second recipe is not going to extract the same amount of coffee material from that bean. Uh, there's one other thing that complicates things too, which is when an espresso is running and water is pushing through that, that coffee, coffee material is coming out. And over 30 seconds, about 20% of this material in the coffee puck goes away. So as your water is going through that puck and time is elapsing, um, this puck is getting thinner and thinner and is resisting water less, which is why we see faster and faster espresso flow as the espresso proceeds. For reasons that aren't really well understood, lighter roast beans seem to fall apart easier. And that's, we don't know why, but the lighter the roast and also certain kinds of beans uh, are more likely to fall apart than others. So what this is meant practically is for those darker Italian uh, styles, that they had had to worry less about their grinders, less worry about puck prep, less worry about high flow rates because the pucks resist water better over time. The style though of lighter roast presents then two problems. One is how do we um, get more water time, water contact, how do we fight that solubility with that lighter roast? And then secondly, how do we keep the puck from disintegrating? Because if it disintegrates, the water just starts gushing and you've got lemonade, which is no fun. So the theory I came up with, which was to try and look at the matrix of possible recipes. And down here, we've got this idea of the lever shot, which is 30 seconds and varies from a flat nine bar shot, which is a, absolutely what you see in most cafes now, to a more historically accurate lever shot, which gently rose pressure and then decreased it. So the idea behind the lever shot versus the nine bar shot 
Remember I just said that pucks are going to lose material over time. Well, that happens with medium to dark rose swell uh, as well. And if you keep the pressure constant, then the speed of the water is gonna accelerate really fast, especially in that last five, 10 seconds. And the flavor is not gonna be great. This is by the way, why people make ristrettos. So if you have an espresso that's falling apart at about 20 seconds, you might just stop it at 20 seconds um, and you'll have a less wide flavor compass, but you won't have a lot of unpleasant sourness. Okay, so the lever profile, instead of holding nine bar constant, instead decreases pressure. And it tries to decrease the pressure at the same rate that this puck is losing material. And the goal of that is to honor the fact that the puck is not resisting water pressure as well. So you give it less water pressure. So that all makes good sense. And this is the why lever shots taste better, especially with medium to dark roast. Now let's move over to two other styles of beans, uh, light and what I'll call ultra light. Now, in order to categorize light, ultra light and medium, and let's say dark beans, um, I use some words describing the flavor instead of looking at the color um, and not really trusting what the roaster says. So what I call a light bean is one that has no, sorry, what I call an ultra light bean is one that has absolutely no flavors generated through the roasting process that tastes of, of, of roasting, say caramelization or Maillard reactions. That's what I call an ultra light. Going to the medium stage, a medium is dominated by uh, roasting flavors, generally chocolate. You might have caramels, you might have toffee, um, but um, that's, that's what a medium looks like. And what I would call a either medium light or a light bean is somewhere in between where you're going to have roasted flavors. And typically like someone might describe a, a light um, bean as having pear caramel flavors, for example. And that the key word to hook onto is caramel. So that caramel flavor is likely created by roasting, just like roasting anything in the oven would do. Some people have objected. Yes, you can get chocolate and caramel flavors innate in beans, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here. And then as you go darker and you ro start roasting more, you'll get darker chocolate, darker roasting until you eventually end up in ultra dark or dark roast oils coming out. And then you start having burn flavors. Um, you don't generally have layers of milky lighter chocolate anymore. Uh, you've got something very, very strong and that would be more like a traditional espresso, especially something you find in France, for example, that, that style is, is still preferred there. So that's how I'm talking about those beans. And notice that I'm talking about the level of roasting causing flavors to change, which is then also changing the solubility and the ability of the puck to resist pressure. Picking the rice recipe is all about finding the recipe that will address the solubility and that puck resistance. If you've got a bean that's medium to dark, in other words, you make an espresso and it's dominated by chocolate flavors, is a good chance that the lever profile and things that look like it, like londinium, are going to be the best for that. If you use a profile that's meant for a light roast on a medium, it's going to generally what I'd call it either over extract it or just come out with lots of um, defective flavor notes because as you roast more and more, there are bad flavors in there too. Let's say really roasty burn flavors. And if you um, leave the beans with too much water contact time, some of those unpleasant flavors are gonna come out. So always with espresso, it's all about getting the good flavors and not having the bad flavors do a 60 second shot with a dark bean and it's gonna taste like a forest fire. It's not gonna be fun. All right, so let's say we're now moving down to the ultralights, which are um, the least soluble and they also don't have caramelization flavors and they are also tending to fall apart. The um, best recipe I've found for that is what I call the allongé or other, Scott Rayo came up with the name 20 years ago. 
And what that is, is one where we're putting a lot of water flow through the puck. It's the highest water flow. It's typically four to four and a half mils per second. And you're going for a very high ratio of water to beans, more in the four to one or five to one, instead of espresso with a medium roast, which is more typically in the two to three to one ratio, right? Two parts water for one part uh, coffee bean. Now, the reason the Allongé works with those ultralights is because you're crashing water so quickly through it and the puck is eroding that it is able to cope with the puck falling apart and still get water out. If you're watching your decent espresso machine and you see the pressure is actually at nine bar, what you don't wanna do with an allongé is make a gusher. So lots of people with traditional machines will make a fast shot and uh, it's done in 15, 20 seconds. But if they had a pressure gauge, they would see that all that's happening is that they're just gushing water through the beans and the Poor solubility of those beans means that only unpleasant flavors are coming out. So in order for the, the allongé to work, we need two things to happen. We need the fast flow rate to adjust the solubility, but we also need a pressure that is in the espresso ranges, which is typically six to 10 bar. So if you've got a bean that really has no caramelization flavors or the caramelization flavors are innate to that bean, then I would highly recommend you try the allongé. So making the allongé means you grind um, fairly coarsely, not that fine. And you're aiming for about a 30, 35 second shot. But what you wanna do is get your grind so that your pressure is ending up in the eight or nine bar range at peak. So you are actually making an espresso. If you think of an espresso as being uh, the, a certain pressure and a certain amount in cup. However, you're putting a lot more water through those beans, which is addressing the low solubility of those. Going up a little bit into slightly more roasted, you've got this intermediate world, which uh, is where most of us live in, in specialty coffee. So either light to medium light. Uh, medium light would be, you still have chocolate flavors, but you are bringing out other flavors, red wine, tropical fruit, flowery flavors are also coming out quite strongly. Um, and uh, yesterday I had one that had strong strawberry notes mixed in with the chocolate. And you don't wanna mute those. Uh, it's quite possible to make that really nice bean only taste like chocolate and, and not bring out those other things. And the art of making good espresso is expressing, sorry, that bean as much as you can to have as wide a compass as flavor as possible. So in general, then, <clears throat> those beans are going to have, um, uh, they're going to extract well at the beginning, medium light to light beans, but you're always going to have an issue with the puck falling apart. The things you can do to avoid that, one is you can buy a good grinder. The worse the grinder, the more likely those light to medium light beans are going to fall apart and channel. So um, generally the point of departure for uh, these Nespresso users is the niche grinder. Um, it's the cheapest grinder that we find acceptable. And, and then you can go up all the way to lots of fancy, beautiful stuff all the way up to Cafetec, which is considered the best grinder. Um, but all the grinders in that sphere should give you very acceptable espresso. If you are using, let's say a SETI grinder, anything from Barazza, um, you're probably not going to have very good light to medium light beans. Those are inexpensive grinders, uh, great value, but I would probably save them for more coarse grinds. Um, actually, the Allongé style would probably work quite well with Barazza grinders since they do coarse fairly well. Um, so the, you've got your medium light to ultra light bean, and it's not tasting very good. So you're wondering, what should I do? So a couple of things you should look at. One is, um, is it just feeling tasting quite acidic? Um, and if so, there's typically two reasons for that. One is the puck is falling apart, okay? Um, and then the second is you're just not addressing the solubility. So you're not opening up the flavors. The 
thing to try, I would go, if you have a lever shot, I would go directly to Allonger because you want to see just how open you can get it and just how big this bean should be. So don't do blooming yet. Do the allonge because you take a, a light bean and you do the allonge style with it and suddenly you're tasting blueberries and flowers and all this crazy stuff and you go, oh, okay, this bean actually has a lot going for it. Okay. Or you don't and you do the allonge and you go, it's still quite subtle. Um, it actually is not a huge, what, what Scott Rayo calls fruit bomb, in which case this middle recipe, which is the blooming recipe, would probably be a good choice. Now, blooming is a kind of compromise between allongé and lever. What it is, is a normal espresso, so pre-infusion, rise to nine bar, decreased pressure, except that if you did that with a light to medium light bean, the solubility means that you wouldn't extract that much from the bean. So what the blooming espresso does is put water in and then pause for 30 seconds while the beans then start to give up their material to the water and then it makes an espresso. So blooming is actually not that weird an espresso shot. Uh, and for that reason, it's kind of my go-to for anything actually that's medium light, anything that's got subtlety to it anything that doesn't have strong off flavors, I love blooming. The typical total runtime for me with blooming is 72 seconds. So it's not great for cafes because it takes twice as long as a normal espresso. Um, but once you dial it in and you nail it, um, it's great because you still have crema, you still have a ratio typically three to one, uh, two and a half to three to one on the beans. So in other words, 15 grams in, will give you between 30 to 45 in the cup. So the thickness of the shot, the TDS, the concentration, still looks like an espresso, whereas Nalonge is looking more like a pour over. It's, it's much more dilute. Um, so those are the three recipes that I, I have. Um, let's go, I haven't talked yet about darker than medium, and then I'll open up to, to questions. So um, darker than medium generally is gonna have off flavors. You're gonna have burn flavors and um, just unpleasant tannins. And really what you're going for is like a nice concentrated, thick chocolate, dark chocolate whack in the face, right? That, that's um, that's the, the style. Um, it also milks quite nicely. And so, uh, you are likely to look at shorter ratios, okay? um, more in the one, a two to one or 1 1.8 to one. It's not unusual for me to do a 15 in and like 26, 28 out if I'm faced with something that has some oils coming out. Now, um, you're also going to try and hide um, flaws in that bean. And I generally find that Going too fine, too slow, will get you a more chocolatey espresso that hides defects. Now that's also the case if you take a really nice bean. So I have a, I have a really good medium bean, which a medium roast bean that has some raspberry notes in it. And I grind it super, super fine. I make a 45 second lever shot with it. And I just have a chocolate bomb. There's no subtlety outside of chocolate, but I do have layers of chocolate. Um, so I've got some milky chocolate, medium, maybe a little bit of dark, but I don't have any burn notes. Um, when I've got a bean that's not very expensive, let's say someone gives me a bag of something roasted in Italy. Um, I know it's not gonna have great subtlety. I know it's gonna have off notes. I also know it's not super fresh. So what am I gonna do with that? I'm probably gonna do a 40, 45 second shot, ground too finely, with a lever profile. The reason I'm using the lever profile and not the flat nine bar uh, is because I don't want a lot of acidity on the end. Generally, I have found the Londinium profile is not good at hiding taste defects. And I think that that's because it has um, a, a more effective pre-infusion uh, where the lever profile doesn't have as effective a pre-infusion. So Londinium is my go-to profile for a medium bean that is good, that has really nice subtleties um, uh, because it's 
somewhere going towards blooming, right? It's a, it's a pressurized pre-infusion with a known quantity of water, um, but it's still doing a nice thick shot. It still looks like a Libra shot. Um, so if you're getting weird off flavors in your medium to dark, I would recommend finer grind and also shorter shots. Pull them, you know, start pulling uh, something that, that looks more like a one to five to one or two to one shot. One last thing I'll say is that if you're new to the decent espresso machine, probably your puck prep is gonna be bad. And uh, that's just what it is because you haven't had access to a machine that gives you feedback showing you your puck prep is bad. And so you should initially strive for shorter ratios of water to coffee. So don't try and do 15 in, 42 out. You, you just, you don't have the skills yet you will, after some time, be able to pull that shot and it will taste great. But um, instead, go for 30, 32 grams out from 15 in um, and get that espresso to taste good. As your grinder gets better, as your puck prep skills get better, you can extend that time, either by, uh, extend that ratio, either by having the shot run a little bit, or generally what people do is grind a little bit coarser. So your 15 in now becomes a 32 out, a 36, a 42 out. Um, and by the way, that ratio of 42 is typically what I'm doing with 15 in, 42 out with something that's light or medium light. Whereas um, 15 in, 36 out is what I'm doing with something that's more chocolate plus medium light. Um, there we go. I saw a comment from Luca and I'm gonna have done my intro lecture. Uh, something in Italy, okay. Uh, feel free guys to throw your questions into the chat if you don't want to speak or if you don't want to, if you do want to speak, I am hitting the mute button now and I'm gonna cause some awkward silence until someone asks a question. So John, this is David. Um, question on those longer shots when you're kind of in the dark range, what starting flow rate? Are you like starting at like half a millisecond or, and then the question I have, should I be trying to keep, cause I actually find for some reason if I, on those, if I start a half a millisecond and maybe end at like two, it tastes good. If I try and shorten it out to straighten the line a little bit and have the lever go down, it doesn't taste as good. Does that make sense from you? Because I, I initially, when I was playing with flow profiles, I figured having a straight flow was better, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, I'm going to get a couple of your, of your okay. questions or statements at various times. So first of all, um, before the descent, there was a lot of talk that straight flow was best in all cases. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think like like wine that doesn't have acidity, it's boring. Coffee without acidity is boring. And if you tame acidity too much, um, the coffee ends up being kind of flat. So that's my feeling. And, and um, over time, we're gonna see the default flow profiles probably next year on the decent change a bit uh, as we get more successful at making flow profiles that taste good. I, I don't feel like we're there yet. Uh, let's talk about your flow rates on, uh, let's say, medium to dark. So I think your um, range of flow rates is greater than I would normally like. You talked about half mil per second up to two mils. Uh, so generally, if I'm going under, let's say, 0.8 mils per second, that would be the slowest I would consider a normal shot. Uh, I'm making what I would call an ultra thick shot. And, uh, and those, those are great. That's a, a style that, that's a lot of fun. But uh, a lever making that would never allow, a lever operator would never allow the espresso to, to go quickly if they're doing that. They would typically ram the puck with, with water, thus jamming it, and then sludge would come out. And as the shot started to speed up, they would be backing off to make sure that it just stayed thick and gloopy. So if you're coming down to half mil per second at the start of your shot, I would say you're making an ultra thick shot. 
and um, a couple different a couple things there. If that's what you want, then um, I would probably change your pressure decrease to be more severe. Okay, and make the shot last longer. It's not unusual for someone with a lever machine to spend 50 seconds making a shot. That, that's, that's totally okay. And for those ultra thick shots, you have to, otherwise you don't have enough in the cup. So um, take the default profile and just slide up and down the end pressure. Okay. Um, and, and bring it down further. So right now I think the default is six, bring it down to like three. In fact, a traditional lead machine ends at zero, right? When the spring yeah. gives up. And, uh, and if you don't have a valve on it, you just take your cup away when, when you're done. So uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a shot that goes to 8.6 bar down to zero and, and you hit stop when you hit your weight. Um, for an ultra thick shot, the rates I'm seeing would be more like half millisecond all the way up to maximum one and a half mils per second. But one oh, two would be okay. kind of more typical um, because I'm just I'm looking for a lot of water contact time, a lot of oils, a lot of thickness. Um, now, there's another approach you can take, which is if you um, if your beans aren't tasting that open, right? Because this thick shot is going to be a chocolate bomb, and mayonnaise and all that good stuff, and the TDS is going to be sky high. So unless you add water you're not gonna taste much subtlety to it, but it, it's a fun style, right? It is absolutely the tradition uh, of espresso. Um, another approach with those beans would be to end at two mils per second, which is absolutely fine, but not go down to such a slow rate at the beginning. So a couple of things you could do. One is you could have a pre-infusion that lasts a bit longer. So um, I'd recommend you don't change anything, just try the Londinium profile. The Londinium profile has a much longer pre-infusion and, um, and thus that starting flow rate is not going to be as low. It's going to be quite a lot higher. You're going to get a lot of thickness during the pressurized pre-infusion of Londinium, uh, just like this coat of mayonnaise floating on your espresso. Um, and um, and that, that's going to be really uh, quite successful. That's actually a, a fun thing then to do is to flip between default and Londinium. And, and see how that's working for you. The other approach you could take is just to go slightly coarser so that you, you are going to sacrifice super thickness at the beginning. However, the flavors in your espresso are going to open up because you've got greater flow rate now. Um, and so it's addressing the solubility of the beans. It's taking out more material. Uh, and, and see if you like that. If these are good, dark roasted beans, they're used, they used nice beans, not rancid, um, you might quite like those flavors. Um, there are a couple things in your uh, question. I, I've lost them now, so can you? No, that's, that's good. And I was, um, someone just gave me some beans. I know, normally actually get my beans now from Dennis Brecky where I, I started at about one, mm -hmm. and I ended at about two. And, yeah. But it's only like right. a 20 second shot. Yeah. It was delicious. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's a medium, more than delicious. Kind of so mm -hmm. they, I'd like to hear more than delicious. What's it like in terms okay, of I'm sorry, I'm, flavors? The more, I like chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I try, I keep trying to go lighter and um, the fruit, I, I guess I keep going back to just kind of a nice chocolate with, um, to me, if I, if I taste chocolate and there's no off flavors and it's just balanced, I'm very happy. So that's kind of boring, I guess, for a lot of you, but it's good. And that stuff's really good in milk too. So did you try the geisha? Oh, I did do the geisha. The only thing I could do the, on the geisha that you gave me, Dennis, is I used the um, Alan J. Yeah. I, I played with a bunch of things. The Alan J was great. Uh, without yes, the yeah. Alan J, um, I don't think I could get enough water to flow through it. No, it'd be, it'd be way too bright and acidic yeah but i still like the chocolatey ones better <laughs> so um i want to uh, just bring up something that i found useful as i you know the journey for a lot of people is from medium to lighter beans uh, as they become more educated mm -hmm. um 
in that that's fine. And, and certainly um, a lot of coffee professionals teased me for preferring uh, or wanting the anchor of chocolate in, in coffee. Um, and I remember Scott Rayo taking me aside and saying, when you say the word chocolate, a lot of the people you're talking to are gonna hear that as a bad thing. And, and that kind of surprised me because to me, that was the anchor of coffee. So there, there definitely are you know, different camps of what people want. Uh, my problem often was the acidity on the light rose. Um, but what I would recommend is a way to kind of flirt with your, your chocolate anchor um, is to get some natural beans, just a small little package of them that has a flavor that would go well with chocolate. So a typical one would be either a natural with some strawberry notes or passion fruit, other tropical things. Um, and then make your own blend. So when you're weighing out your dose, let's say it's 15 grams, just put two grams of that natural into, into your, your scale. Uh, and that's really a lot of fun. That, that's a way to, to just kind of complexify what you're doing. Um, so just a little tip there. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to go from the top. So talking about the, the allonger, um, how to make a good allonger, how would a beginner move toward that? So when I was first doing the, the allonger, and I remember um, visiting Square Mile in London, uh, James Hoffman wasn't there, he was his staff there, and I was delivering the machine, and, and I made an allonger for them. And they looked at it, and they were like, wow, that looks like a gusher. Uh, and everyone tasted, and everyone's eyebrows went up and said, that, that tastes a lot better than it should. And, and the reason is, is that water coming through an espresso machine so quickly has always been associated with your channeling or your, your badly dialed in. The reason for that is most espresso machines out there tell you pressure of the pump, not pressure of the puck. And in order to make an allonger, you need to have espresso-like pressures at the puck. So you need to have a machine that tells you that. There aren't a lot of them. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of machines that do flow profiling and give you real pressure. Uh, so in order to do an allonger, it's not that hard. I would start with a dose, just say 18 gram basket, 18 grams, okay? Fairly coarse and put it in there. Um, and <clears throat> uh, I believe it is, it is set to, to stop volumetrically, but go for like a four to one ratio in 30 seconds. And what you are gonna find is that the pressure reading on the decent espresso machine will tell you what's going on. Now, if you grind too fine, which is typically what happens, typically people are too fine because they're coming from traditional espresso. You're just gonna go max out. You're gonna go up to like 12, 13 bar um, and you're not gonna hit your goal weight in the time you wanted. So just back off the grind. In fact, this is the easiest way to dial in allongé is just back off the grind so that it's over pressure, over pressure, and now suddenly you're in eight or nine bar and you're fine. So that's your first goal is for your allongé peak pressure to be around eight or nine bar. If it peaks around four bar, it's not gonna taste good. Now, the next thing that, well, that you'll start to worry about is your end pressure. Now, this is more tricky and definitely better grinders are gonna give you better results. Um, if you find yourself crashing, going from nine bar to two, uh, then you've got a problem. And that problem can either be resolved with changing the dose, changing the grinder, or better puck prep. And those are the things I would try to, to fiddle with. Um, but I have found the allongé pretty easy to dial in because as long as I am in that sort of nine bar at the start and I don't go below four bar at the end, uh, four bar, by the way, is where puck compresses between three and four bar. Uh, I think that's why espresso tastes quite bad under four bar, because I think the puck then is no longer compressed. So those are my ranges. Um, and there's so much water and so much dilution that even if it's channeling, it channels briefly because there's just water going everywhere. Um, and you end up something that's, with Allonger, that's something that's almost tea-like because of the dilution and because of the openness of the flavors. Is that helpful? 
Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Good. Um, all right. Pressure profiles versus flow profiles. So um, when we were uh, reaching out to coffee experts to talk about flow and design the espresso machine, the decent, um, flow was all the buzz. And I'm not sure why. I think because chemically flow is the most important thing when extracting materials in other fields. And so it was like flow, 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 pressure doesn't even matter. We can make great shots if we just master flow. And, and that was just wrong, it turns out. Uh, so there are profiles that are flow profiled in the espresso machine and decent, and they're quite hard to dial in at the moment. So take like the, the default flow profile for milk. Um, I don't ever use that profile as it now stands. I'm not happy with it. And, and the reason is, is that it's incredibly hard to get your grind such that you don't go over nine and a half bar. And if you go over nine and a half bar, the puck then goes through its secondary compression, which is something we didn't know about five years ago. Um, and then you get these incredibly muted flavors, uh, tannins come out, eventually the puck channels enough that you get out of that high pressure situation and, and your shot looks good, um, but it doesn't taste good. So going above 10 and a half bar generally doesn't yield good flavors. Now, I'm sure there's research to be done here and, and to figure out what uses that ultra high pressure might have, but right now we don't know what to do with that. Uh, where flow is useful is if you, um, if you want to have a curve that follows the flow so that the, the, the shot doesn't speed up, <clears throat> you could use flow profiling to do that. But how do you know where that should be, right? Should, should you be at one and a half mils per second, two mils per second, one six, one seven? And the problem is if you go from one five mils per second and you're let's say at six bar, and you go to one seven mils per second, you'll suddenly find you're at 10 bar because small changes in flow cause big changes in pressure. That's just physics, okay? So that's quite hard. And, uh, but there is something really great about flow profiles and that's that um, they automatically back off on the pressure as the puck starts to de uh, de um, uh, give up matter and, and fall apart. So, that's the nice theory about flow profile flow steps. Um, but we've got this big problem, which is how do you, where, where do you situate your flow line so that you get the pressure in the nice area that you like? So that's been an unsolved problem until last week. And uh, so Jonathan Gagne sent me a paper saying, I think I can solve this problem with, by this new kind of espresso, but you're gonna have to add a programming language to the decent. I talked to Ray and Ray said, well, I have a programming language for you. Um, and we've been waiting to, to implement it until we had a coffee reason. I thought Jonathan Gagne's theory was bang on. But then the next day he came back and says, ah, I can do a good amount of my theory right now with the, uh, the programmability of the decent today. And that's what we're calling, well, not I'm calling, Jonathan calls adaptive profiles. And what adaptive profile is, is it's taking your flow line and it's moving it up or down adapting to your grind and your dose to get you so that your uh, peak pressure is where you want to be so they are what i would call the the um the the most likely to succeed flow profiles when i'm talking about flow profiles by the way i'm talking at the extraction stage not pre-infusion okay uh, i'm talking about using defined flow during the extraction so uh, those are out there in the next few days. Uh, right now you have to download it from either Basecamp or I guess his website. And um, in the next few days, I'm going to release a release D1 app, which is uh, just the last few bug fixes and then a new beta. And a new beta will have two profiles from Gagne that he's got version numbers on and then everyone can try those adaptive flow profiles. Uh, that's That's, I mean, kind of super exciting, right? Because we made the decent with all this excitement around flow and then uh, we use it to watch the screen, but, but making shots with actually pure flow profiling hasn't been successful until, you know, Mr. Brainy shows up, uh, which is great. 
So that's that's my answer um, for the time being. I, the the profiles that all work best on the decent espresso machine um, are ones that use flow for pre infusion because the puck is absorbing all the water. There is no pressure, so um, pre infusion can only be discussed rationally in terms of flow, and then move to pressure because a small change in pressure is an incredibly small change in flow. I mean, we see it in our charts. And since they're aiming, let's say for seven to nine bar, it's really hard to nail the flow to get into that pressure range. So just the dial for getting your espresso perfect is so much finer if you're working with a pressure profiled step um, than with flow. Does that help? Um, John, I think I've got a, a slightly different question on it, which is, so let's say that you have you have your shot, you've pre-infused, you filled up the puck, and then it's um, it's ramped up and it's pressurized up to nine bar, and you're you're getting whatever your flow rate is. Um, so at from that point, then then let's say you, you get about you know ten milliliters of um, of extraction, um, and at this point the puck is going to change, and something is going to change about the pressure or the flow in your espresso. So here we could have, we could keep it up as a pressure profile and the puck resistance will drop and we'll start to get a faster flow rate. Um, and so maybe let, let's say we, that we, we get to that point where we've gotten that 10 mils out and we're 20 seconds in. Um, and then you have a pressure profile, that pressure profile might finish off the shot in call it 30 seconds or something because it, it's going to gush out. The remainder of the shot's going to gush out pretty quickly. So alternatively, we could at that point, 20 seconds in, go to a flow profile, which will lock us in at the flow rate that we've got there. The flow rate won't accelerate, so the pressure will drop, and then we'll, we'll get our shot finished in maybe 40 seconds or something like that. So we've got two quite different shots that we could get. One that's going to be higher in pressure, but faster in flow rate. And one that's going to be um, lower in, sorry, yeah, low, uh, lower in pressure and slower in flow rate. So the pressure profiled shot will come out faster. The flow rate profiled shot will come out slower. Do we actually know, can we describe how they will taste different? Okay, um, I'm going to back up a little bit. So this, I'm, I'm going to draw on my finger a, a typical shot, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, typically it's going to pre-infuse, this is pressure, and it'll ramp up, and then you've got pressure, and you've got somewhere between five and 10 seconds where um, I call this the puck reorganiz reorganization uh, phase because liquid's coming out, but pressure is not unchanging. So the theory behind coffee is if materials coming out, pressure should decrease because puck resistance should be decreasing. So the only way that you can have a flat top of that volcano um, is if the puck is reorganizing. And then at some point it stopped reorganizing and this is with steady flow and then pressure starts coming down. That's what a shot looks like. Um, I'm, going to not answer Luca's question just for a second, because this is what uh, Gagne is explicitly working on, is, so I've got the pressure going up here, and I've got my flow here, okay? Now, if I've got constant flow, what's going to happen is this is going to go up like this, we're going to go like that, and then we're going to go down, okay? Um, and what, now, now I'm going to speak to to Luca's point, which is, if we set this flow, here, this flow rate, to some point in this espresso, then the machine will automatically change pressure for us so that the, the flow does what, do, does what we want, okay? Um, and Gagne's first adaptive profiles have anchored themselves to this first peak pressure. So what is the flow at that peak pressure? But that peak pressure uh, tends to correspond to a lower than desirable flow generally. So Gagne's second version is, I think he's trying to look at the flow at the end of that puck reorganization phase when pressure starts to go down. And he's basically picking different points to see what ends up tasting better. Um, 
And um, whereas that that first, uh, actually, Gagnon went further and he said that he thinks the puck is still has dry spots during what I'm calling the puck reorganization phase. So he doesn't want to use that the flow rate while the puck is effectively still pre infusing as the anchor. He wants to use a, a flow rate when the puck is actually fully saturated, uh, which sounds right if he's right. So um, the best tasting espressos seem to be with, let's say, medium to medium light beans. I'm ignoring, I'm, I'm talking about tradition. Okay, so we take our, our, our pressure here and we got a flow. They seem to be with a flow that does increase. With a flow that does this, ends up, this end bar part ends up tasting quite bad. But totally fat, flat flow is more the exception than the rule in terms of tasting best. Some sort of flow increase over a shot seems to taste best. Now you'll notice that isn't what I've programmed with the uh, existing flow profiles, because that was not my thinking five years ago. Uh, but now I've come to, to the feeling that going, let's say, from one mil per second to two mils per second over a shot tastes a lot better than one mil constant. Now, uh, it might be that as the bean gives up more material, its solubility goes down. And so we actually need greater flow toward the end of the shot to continue getting the same extraction rate. That might be what's going on, it's a good theory. Um, or it might be that the increase in flow is giving us more acidity and that if you keep it completely flat, um, the decrease in acidity makes it flat tasting. Now it is absolutely the case, I have never seen an espresso that had a decreasing flow rate that was interesting tasting. It's been very tamed acidity, but it's been super boring. So flat to slightly increasing flow rates tend to taste the best in my experience. So um, what Gagne is trying to do is essentially, he's calling an adaptive flow profile, but it's really like the best of both worlds, which is you use flow for pre-infusion when there is no pressure. Then you switch to a pressure profile to figure out what is what flow rate gives us a nine bar to eight to nine bar pressure. And then once we are finished fully saturating that, then we would normally with a lever machine or by manually changing the end pressure on the decent, we would be trying to get a flow curve that does what we want. And in fact, that's exactly what I do. That's how, why the default profile goes from nine bar to six bar is because that generally gives us a flow curve that looks like this, okay? With a medium bean. But if you throw a lighter bean in there or a bean that falls apart faster, it does this. And, and this is flow. And the way to compensate is you take your pressure and you do that with it, right? You make your pressure decrease faster so that now your, your flow kind of backs off a bit. So we've been doing that as part of the dialing in process. I mean, we, I mean, everyone with a decent machine has been um, looking at the end flow rate and decreasing the end pressure in order to make that be what we want. What Gagne is proposing is pick just a few numbers, right? Pick um, your peak pressure that you want, start flow, end flow, and it will sort it out for you, right? It'll, it'll um, sorry, start flow and end flow ratio. So it's gonna go from one to two or one five to two five or 0.5 to one five, but it's gonna, it's gonna have that line. Uh, does that answer your question or your, your I guess it was more of a comment, Luca, that, that's what I, where I see this going. Um, I see flow profiling for, um, so I've got pre-infusion, hold, um, and decline are the three names that I gave the three stages. I see pre-infusion staying with flow. I see um, the hold stage going, staying with pressure as being the best idea, but I see decline becoming a flow shot uh, a flow step once we we crack this hmm. yeah I'm, i mean i'm glad to hear that you know we, we've got more research to do on it um I, I guess the observation that i'd make is your observation that you just made earlier about alon j what, like why does alon j taste good when a gusher espresso tastes bad mm -hmm. and your answer was that well you've got enough pressure there so you can extract flavor and it tastes good mm -hmm. so that reasoning would lead you to believe that 
um, if you try and maintain flow rate, you may be missing towards the end of the shot, you may be missing out on extracting that flavor that you can get by virtue of higher pressure. So yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what I was interested in, in working out where this is going. So, so um, the T Porter filter has got a spring on it and um, uh, that latches typically at two bar, you can really tighten it and go up to four bar. We're going to get some other springs over the next year you can swap them out and it might be able to um, crack this big problem, which is coffee is both physical resistant to water and something that gives flavor. If we could use say the tea porter filter to have the ground coffee only serve the function of giving up flavor and use a mechanical spring to create pressure then we might be able to do some interesting things. So imagine if the tea porter filter could be set to eight bar, um, we could do an allongé at eight bar the whole time through um, and have that eight bar. Um, and the flow rate would remain constant because it's pushing against the spring as opposed to pushing against coffee beans. That's a really good point. I, I guess what we could do is to get um, one of the pressurized porter filters that you get for capsules and stuff like that for E60 for 58 millimeter porter filter machines, grind to coarse and extract that through the pressurized porter filter and through a regular porter filter and taste the difference between the two. So we've experimented with those. The ones I found are around three bar. Uh, the, the general problem with building a pressurized porter filter is that um, you do that by having a little aperture um, that everything has to squeeze through. And that gets clogged. Um, so I haven't found a pressurized porter filter that goes to proper espresso pressures. Um, Ray has designed one, we haven't built it, that has an automatic fixing process. In other words, if actually something were to get jammed in there, it basically opens itself up to let it through and then relatches itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually, that's currently a hard problem. And, and uh, we'll have to see when we take the T porter filters and we make them do things they weren't meant to do. Are they going to start jamming as well? Um, so I've got uh, Jonas Chen asks, can water sit in the tray for too long and become too stale acidic? Um, by, I'm not sure you mean by tray, you mean water tank? Okay, um, so uh, water, um, for water to change, something needs to happen to it, right? So if I take this, this bottle and I open it, it's now exposed to oxygen and it's going to aerate. So if I were to boil water, for example, and put it in here and cap it, uh, if I drank it right away, it would be a low oxygen water and it wouldn't taste very good. If I open it and let it sit for a couple hours, it would taste better. Um, the water that comes out of the tap, say, has chlorine in it and letting it sit in the water tank is gonna cause it to outgas, lose its chlorine and taste better. Um, you'll notice that the, um, the top of the water tank is not covered hard. So let's assume you're not using chlorinated water, please. Uh, you're using just some sort of good water. The water in the D1 sitting in the tank is not gonna taste worse over time um, because it is exposed to oxygen. So it should stay oxygenated. One of the things we also do is we circulate a little bit. You know, when you start your espresso, stuff gets sucked in and sent back. Um, so um, it's possible a very small mosquito might get in there. That would be the only thing uh, I worry about. Um, if you're someplace where that, that can happen, you can um, buy the, the third party lid. But water sitting in the tank shouldn't become stale, right? So people talk about stale water in a traditional boiler machine and uh, with good reason. So there, there's, I think, two things going on with those boiler machines and stale water. Uh, one is the water goes in and then it's heated, right? And, and it's, it's quite full. Uh, and I think that that's just becoming deoxygenated water. So that, that's one issue. Um, the other is, is that water 
when it's heated, gives up scale, which drops to the bottom of the boiler. If you then put fresh water into a boiler that's got a bunch of scale in there, uh, some of that scale is then going to go back into the water. And so you end up with uh, over-mineralized water with um, espresso machines. So the, the fact that we largely let the water sit and then we heat it on demand um, in a pressurized situation uh, means that the water should taste its best. Uh, so I, I don't think we've got an issue there. Uh, one thing I will mention is in the latest firmware that's coming out in beta next week, um, the way that the refill kits work is changed a little bit to keep the water tank at an absolute minimum. Um, now, what I mean by that is, let's say you're making uh, a pour over and, and the water tank is really low, uh, it's gonna, it now gets automatically refilled um, in little pulses so it can keep up with the recipe. And, and we now keep the, the water tank at that point quite low. That gives us less water to have to preheat um, and, um, and less noise. Um, so that should also give you water that's just freshly arrived in the tank uh, that way. And in general, I think we're gonna to try to move to a system where there's less water in the tank. You don't need to store as much um, that, uh, and the water ends up being used much sooner. That, that's just uh, a goal in the new approach. Now, those of you who don't have refill kits or catering kits won't see a change. But if you do, you're, you're going to notice that you're going to be topping up your water tank as you're making espresso. Yeah, Luca, you are a little bit soft, um, so we can hear you, but um, if you can move to the microphone closer next time. So, uh, Majid, you asked, it'd be great if there are some conditions on advanced profiles, like don't go above nine bar. Uh, it would help in flow profiles. Um, so that is absolutely happening in the next three months. Um, it's not just going to be advanced profiles. The latest firmware I have from Ray has uh, pressure limitation features on the firmware. So we'll be able to say, for example, give me a, a flow shot that goes from one to two mils per second, but don't go over nine bar. Um, and, uh, and it'll do that. And that, that feature is being added because we now have an understanding of secondary puck compression, which I don't think anyone who doesn't have a decent knows is a thing, but uh, there it is. Um, so that's, that's one of the things coming in. You, by the way, in advanced profiles today can have a profile that goes over pressure and then decides to do something else. Um, I have experimented with the end of blooming, for example, it's flow and made the blooming shot go to two mils per second. But if you're over nine and a half, drop to one nine. If you're still over one and a half, drop to this, 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 so pull off flow if we're over pressure. Um, and um, just, I guess I haven't really reached a, a conclusion as to that being better in all cases. Because bear in mind, when I make a change to a default profile that goes out to all of you, it, it needs to taste better for everyone. If it tastes better for some people and worse for others, that wasn't an improvement. Um, so I'm reticent to do that, uh, but, I, yes, in fact, I, I know that Londinium has an exit. Um, I think, am I right? If he goes under a certain pressure, he changes the flow. I think that's what it does on, on the end of Londinium. Anything else, guys? Hello, John. Uh, I do have a question. Um, uh, Who's I like this? To I'm Filippi. I'm from Brazil. Great. I, 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 so I'm not a, a decent uh, owner yet, so I'm planning to, to have a decent. So my question is regarding what you mentioned about puck, puck prep and how decent can forgive a bad puck prep. And I can detail my question a little. Um, I had a previous machine, uh, which I think channel like hell. So I changed the machine to a E61 group head and keeping the same barista, bad puck prep or, bad or good, um, the channel is appearing, I don't know, 95%. Uh, I still have some challenge if I go for more light, uh, uh, not very medium or dark rows. 
so um, for instance, speaking compared to this and using the E61 profile with uh, E61 machine uh, with a medium or bad put prep, how do you think this machine can compare in the forgiveness factor? So I, I had a, um, a GS3 from Lamazoko for many years and my shots would frequently channel at the start. It took me a long time to figure out why. And um, it's because most traditional machines um, will just turn the pump on at the beginning of the espresso. And uh, my GS3 was uh, defaulting to 12 mils per second flow rate. So it's like a hose just hitting the, the, the puck. And any flaws in that puck would be immediately exposed and turned into channels, which is why the GS3 is a great machine for professionals who have very good puck prep, who might make virtually defect-free pucks. Um, that was not me. I, I, had, I made pucks with defects. And so most of my shots would, would channel because of that initial thrash on, on the puck. Now, um, I, thanks to Home Barista, was able to open up the side panel of the GS3 and slow the flow rate down. I, I, I impeded the flow on, on the Fluidotech pump down to about six mils per second. Um, and then my channeling largely went away. Now, the downside on that machine is that now my peak pressure was, was significantly lower as well, um, because that's that machine, that's how it works. You slow down pre-infusion, well, you slow down the pump in general. Um, so in general, in fact, um, there's a James Hoffman video, the slow motion video. You really should watch that. It's a really fun video. He took a slow motion, high resolution. And at one point he talks about how he really wanted to do a slow motion video of channeling. But unfortunately, the only thing he had in the studio was the decent and that he was unable to make it channel. Uh, and I've had that problem too. Four years ago, people would come for demos and I would easily be able to make a channel. I just take a toothpick and put it in. And then I, and it, it became harder as we improved the machine. And I would stick a piece of rice in the puck to try and cause some channeling. And now even that doesn't cause channeling. And uh, the reason that decent tends to not channel is because of the gentle pre-infusion. Okay? So uh, what that means is that you've got a puck that maybe has got a little divot here. Because we're pre-infusing slower um, and, and also our, um, there's a lot more headspace, what happens is the water comes in and that whole puck just swells like a sponge and the defects just kind of go away. And then when we are saturated, we then ramp the pressure up kind of slowly over four seconds as opposed to bang. Um, so um, that's one of the big reasons um, why our shots don't channel as much. And then the, the, the next one is, um, if you look at a traditional E61 machine and you look at the water dispersion, the water dispersion behind the shower, they typically have like six or eight holes and they're, they're pretty big. It's a big press, press piece. They have this thing with six holes and they're like all right there. Um, and that's getting hit with 12 mils per second. So do the math, you're at two mils per second. It's like little water picks, right? On all those little things. So that's incredibly channel producing. Um, I think this is why people on Home Barista um, see such effects by getting different shower screens because the shower screen is effectively blocking the drilling of those water dispersion holes on those traditional machines. And when we modeled that, it just we were horrified at not even not at how uneven the water was and also just what it did to the pucks. Um, so the um, holes that disperse water on the decent, I think there's 29 of them, which is quite a lot of them. Uh, they're calibrated sizes. Uh, and they're set up so that at different flow rates, they're even at different points, there's different heights of them. So um, I think, and that's all Ben's work. In fact, that's why he got hired because he, he did all this work and posted on Home Barista and showed the fluid dynamic simulations of how superior this was. Um, and um, uh, so those two things, uh, the, the, the gentle pre-infusion, uh, lower flow rate, um, and the dispersion. I think especially that second one is important because if people do do the kind of water hammer shots on the decent, right, the, the um, traditional Italian that just goes nine bar hard, they still don't channel on the decent. 
And I think that's because that fast flow rate is being spread across a lot, across a lot more holes. Um, and also, let's be honest, that flow rate, when I use Londinium, it's eight mils per second. It's still not the GS3's 12 mils per second. So it's still not as insane as that. Uh, does that help you answer your question? Yeah, a lot. Uh, you have previously said that Barat's uh, grinders are also tend to cause channeling. I think you have mentioned the SETI grinder. Uh, why is that? And and you have in this call mentioned about uh, other Barat's grinders. So do you think do you not recommend Barat's grinders to use in pair with the Dyson? Barat's grinders are fantastic for pour overs, um, and and I, I would thoroughly recommend them for that. Um, but in the under five hundred US dollar world. Um, something has to give. And Baratza, especially the SETI, is extremely feature heavy, right? It's, it's, it, it's very nice to look at and it's got all this digital stuff, but you open it up, everything's plastic. Uh, it breaks quite easily and it tends to not grind very fine. Um, so, um, so that's the first problem. Um, the second is it with the SETI is um, it has dosed into the portafilter as a cool feature but um, the particles spray out of that thing in a very uneven way. And so if you dose from a SETI directly into a portafilter, it's gonna channel. You'll get much better results if you uh, dose from a SETI into their plastic cup, shake to homogenize and then dose. Uh, then what's hap I think what's happening is the SETI has um, uh, a very um, bipolar grind profile, I should say boulders and fines. And I think when it comes out of the SETI, they're quite separated. My guess is the fines are outside the boulders and the inside. That's my guess. Whatever. Uh, what I do know is that if you take the SETI and then you shake the hell out of the grinds in, in their plastic thing and then dose it, that your uh, channeling will go way down. Um, next, the SETI, um, if you don't have certain shims installed, just doesn't grind fine enough to work on the decent. So depending on what model you've got from them, you have to ask them to send you shims to, to grind finer. Uh, it's just, I don't think it makes any sense to buy a machine as tuned towards making the best coffee in the world and then buy a, 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 a really, you know, the best low end grinder there is. To me, that the, the, the SETI is the best low end grinder. Just don't do that. Um, go get the cheapest high end grinder there is, which is the niche. Uh, just just go to that next level uh, and people who have the niche just don't have that problem or if you want to spend more then there's the lagum there's loads of beautiful grinders out there yeah but, but uh scott rail used the um the forte with the distance right yeah he doesn't anymore um uh, it changes uh, but he used the forte because it, it's great for porvers and it, and it really is uh, but um, I, I had him use the niche at a trade show in Los Angeles, and he's never looked back. Thank you. And, and he wrote a great endorsement for them, you know, and he doesn't get any money from, from Baratza or niche. Uh, but I, I think that Scott was really trying to engage with Baratza because he felt they had a grinder that was almost great. Uh, but uh, Scott Rayo is not Baratza's market. Hey, John, uh, this is uh, Jeff Kletsky. I've got a question. Earlier, you were talking about the flow rate uh, during extraction not going below uh, one milliliter per second. Uh, when I typically uh, pull what I now am reasonably confident is somewhere between a light and a medium light roast, uh, using something like LRV2 or the LEVA profile, uh, the flow starts out uh, when that pressure first comes up. I'm looking at a graph here uh, between half and one milliliter per second. Within five seconds, it's at one. Within 10 seconds, I'm sort of at my typical target of between one, five, and two. Um, is that outside what you are finding to, to bring out the best flavors? Uh, so Londinium is, is, a, is not a profile that I can apply um, uh, these rules too, okay? Because okay. What, what, so what Londinium does is a pressurized pre-infusion. 
And, and so it, it, uh, it tries to have that kind of GS3 um, puck slamming at the beginning because uh, we found that a very fast saturating of the puck tends to compress it much faster and tends to give you much denser, thicker start. So that's what Damien is, is doing at the start of Londinium. That's why the pump is, you know, blasting with water. Uh, but Damien is compensating for the defects of that approach, which is generally if you keep up that water hammer, then you're going to start channeling. So what he does is he quickly hits the, the puck with, with water, so it compresses, and then immediately backs off on the pressure down to three bar. So that uh, the puck does have, the, the three bars is, is actually the same pressure that the uh, blooming also stops um, pre-infusion at, because that three bar seems to be a good amount of pressure to augment capillary action pre-infusion with a pressurized pre-infusion and get the water through the puck more evenly faster. Okay, So a bit of pressure during pre-infusion um, seems like a good idea if you want to get a more even extraction. So that, that's one of the reasons I think Allonger, uh, sorry, Blooming gets us the high refractometer readings is because of the pressurized pre-infusion. So back to Londinium. Londinium has, has stolen that idea from Blooming. And it's, it's great. Um, so he's doing fast pre-infusion like the, the tradition, but then backing off and doing a three bar hold like a blooming. Um, and during that time, you're not really getting leakage. What you're getting is like sludge, mayonnaise coming off the bottom because the puck has been so compressed. So that flow right. rate at the beginning isn't actually what I would call extraction. That is leakage from pre-infusion. Um, yeah. And uh, that flow rate should be really low. I mean, that should be down in the 0.3, 0.5 range. Um, so you're getting uh, a beautiful thick top to your espresso. And, and then as he comes out of that, then he pulls a kind of traditional espresso, which has much less body. But you know, when you sip your espresso, you get whatever's floating on top on your tongue and your lips. And so the perception of Londinium shots is it's super creamy because he had that, that hard start with the pressure hold, which created a floating mayonnaise cap on his espresso, um, but then ended it with a proper espresso. So um, I, I, I think of Londinium profile in the decent as, as the best expression of the tradition because we're getting the benefits of that ultra thick start but we are still getting a proper pre-infusion and we're still in the blooming idea of using pressurized pre-infusion for a faster, more even one. And I totally could see for um, a light roast that Londinium would get you better flavors. Um, I mean, just contrast it with a sec for a second with the Slayer shot, which when I first got to Decent, I thought was the way you should work with light roast. So a Slayer shot takes a puck, and puts water slowly onto the top, let's say two mils per second, for typically like 35, 40 seconds. And at the end of that time, the puck is fully saturated, pressure rises. Um, now, um, the nice thing about that is if you, you've got a light rose that needs a lot of water contact time because of poor solubility, it addresses that, sort of. Because the problem is, is that it actually takes 35 seconds before you actually start to see water on the bottom with the Slayer shot, if you're looking at it. In fact, you end your Slayer pre-infusion when you see water on the bottom. So what that means is the top has been pre-infused for 35 seconds and the bottom has been pre-infused for one or two seconds. And there's a gradient between them. So what you get out of that Slayer technique is a extremely uneven pre-infusion shot. So I would even say that you get a top that's over-extracted and a bottom that's under-extracted. So it's kind of like the worst of all worlds as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it really bothered Rayo that I at the time liked the Slayer shot um, because he would give me these incredible light roast Kenyans that I just channeled like hell. And the Slayer technique was the only one I could make a shot of of any sort that didn't you have a pressure that did this. Um, that, that long pre-infusion let me get 
some sort of pressure. So he developed blooming because, um, or the insight in blooming was to figure out how much water the puck should have and then use time, capillary action, and a small amount of pressure to get the bottom of the puck wet as quickly as possible. And when you do a blooming, you'll see like three seconds into the pre-infusion, the water will go and then it stops, right? And then you get a few drips, like six grams of drips. Uh, Londinium is doing kind of the same thing, right? That it's hitting it and then stopping the pump. And the bottom of the puck is wet within like a second or two of the top of the pump. So for a light rose, Londinium would be kind of the only lever profile that I would endorse because Londinium is giving light rose an even pre-infusion a fast equal pre-infusion and enough time um, during that pre-infusion to actually address the solubility of light rose. So I'm glad to hear you're getting good results with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm very happy with it. I'm getting, you know, I don't know how much I trust my refractometer, but uh, with a centrifuge, I'm uh, Tago, I'm getting about 22% uh, EY. Cool. Uh, and this is, La Cabra, Passenger, um, light to light roasts, uh, typically Ethiopian or Kenyan these days. Yeah, are you getting any crema? Sort of. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting no crema. Mm -hmm. this, I mean, I mean this pretty until I stir it. Yeah, it, it's a light roast, so I wouldn't expect much. Um, but it's nice to hear you do. I mean, it's it's great to take a light roast bean and still be able to make something that looks like a traditional espresso, but have it taste good. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been happy. I'm just, I'm always looking for how can I improve it? So I may try to poke around and see if I can bring up that initial uh, extraction phase rate a little bit. Yeah, or um, you could also just lengthen that three bar pre-infusion phase by five seconds. See what that does to the flavor. Okay, great, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I've got a question from Taylor that it's about to scroll off, so I wanna hit it. Uh, Taylor says, jumping back to Dylan, sometimes I have confusing results. Sometimes for my, my latest beans, full city beans pulled with blooming profile. I got to 85 bar and I wanted to drop peak pressure slightly, so I backed off the grind size. Peak pressure after going slightly coarser was 12. Um, Okay, uh, I don't know what to tell you um, because blooming, I mean, what's happening is your grinds are fitting amongst each other and you've got fines, so, um, which are also complicating the whole thing. So uh, blooming is, is, I find the most frustrating shot to dial in and getting that pressure at the end can be quite hard. Um, so the best blooming shots I've had have been those where I have um, some dripping at the end of pre-infusion, usually between three grams and eight grams of dripping. So that's why the reason I put the, the total weight line on the decent. So during the pre-infusion phase of blooming, there, there is some dripping. If you have no dripping, you're too, um, you're too fine. If you get more than 10 grams, I find the shot uh, did not hold the water during pre-infusion. I won't get the pressure I need. It, it doesn't work that well. Um, I guess I would say, Taylor, don't worry about hitting eight five bar. If you can get six or seven bar at the end of blooming um, and your puck doesn't fall apart during that last blooming stage, then you'll probably get good tasting results. Um, getting I mean, if you got 8.5 bar peak pressure, you're probably as good as you're going to get, um, unless the, the puck fell apart at the end. That's always been the most frustrating thing for me. Uh, that's why I was so happy and I promote Allongé because uh, Rayo was um, giving me ultralight rose for blooming. And for me, the peak pressure would hit at the end and then it would just fall apart like two seconds later and I would get something really unpleasant. He would pull his, um, he's a better barista than I am he would pull his bloomings out like five more seconds than me. And uh, mine were always best around 72 seconds. He'd throw like 77, 78 seconds. 
Okay, I just have um, w one quick follow-up question for you there is um, when you're talking about the puck falling apart, um, would that just be indicated by like one of the cues you'd look for for that, just the pressure just drops Pressure or crash, right? Because the end of blooming is a constant flow step. Mm -hmm. And so you hit peak pressure. And I mean, ideally you want something that looks like this, right? Um, sometimes you'll see that as the puck organizes, but um, if it does, you know, like, It'll like mm -hmm. nine bar two. <laughs> gotcha. And then, uh, and I, so one thing also to note on um, the, so any, any constant flow step during extraction, if you look at the pressure line, it's telling you stuff about the puck that's quite interesting. Um, and um, so if constant flow pressure goes up, you have this kind of, flat volcano top right here. We know the puck must be reorganizing because it's giving up material. And then it comes down. And if you have linear extraction, which is what we think coffee does, um, then you should have linear pressure decrease too. So you should have a line that kind of does this, right? And if it does that, then you know you just got a channel, right? You're, you're linear, you lost pressure, and then it fixed itself and then continued. If you have pressure decreasing, and then it suddenly it does that, right? You have an inflection point. Then you know that you, um, uh, you've given up the ghost. At that point, your puck is now um, no longer linear extracting, right? You're, you, you've gone linear extraction and then boom. If you see that elbow, you should stop the shot at that point. And that in fact is, is what I use as the measure on blooming shots. I'll see peak pressure go up at the end and then it's going down and then it'll maybe do that, and then it does that. And as soon as it starts to crash, stop. Because at that point, your shot has, um, well, there's only two things I think that can happen that can cause that. One is it's irretrievably channeled, or you have run out of soluble materials, um, but uh, that's unlikely. So generally stop there and, um, there, there is an option. I've disabled it at the time. It's, it's a feature you can re-enable that shows you the first derivative of pressure, just to say the change in pressure. And um, it's useful, or it was useful for seeing channels back when we had a lot of them. Um, and that feature might come back to help us understand when to stop a shot, right? When okay, linear yeah, extraction that's, that's stops. It. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, nothing. I was just saying, like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just another kind of cue that as to what's, you know, causing that, uh, the change in pressure that you're seeing. What's going on there? And that's helpful. Yeah, I guess the general thing I was just thinking of was, like, I get these weird results, like I was talking about the pressure, like, I decrease grind size and the pressure jumps up. And I'm just like, oh, I guess my main question was just, how do I interpret that? Or where do I go from here? It sounds like mostly it's just, this is just a very finicky profile, which there's like, I know there are things like, the flow uh, or the pressure can get so low at the end of pre-infusion that kind of where you are at the end of pre-infusion in terms of pressure can have a huge impact on how high it actually goes up after the um, pulse starts, right? Yeah, so I I, have mod I don't like the end of, of blooming. I feel like it's just too finicky. Um, and the reason uh, Rayo put in constant flow at the end is because he didn't want a channel to create something that would be super acidic. If you made a pressure profile at the end, and the shot fell apart, it would be undrinkable. So he figured constant flow, squeeze out what's already there um, is, is our best approach. Um, I modified the, um, at this LA show, it's the last show I did with Rayo before COVID. Uh, and I modified the bloomings we were there doing there so that the last stage said, do this flow rate. I don't remember what it is, like 2.2 .2 mils per second, maybe at the end of blooming. And I said, but if pressure, is, what did I say? If pressure goes under six bar, then do two mils per second. And if it's still under six bar, do one eight mils per second. Just keep lowering the flow if we're going under six bar, because I don't want to do a super low pressure shot. Um, and, uh, and same thing, um, did I get that right? No, sorry. Lower the flow if we went over a nine and a half bar, but increase the flow if the pressure is too low. Um, 
and um, kind of the jury was kind of out. He's like, huh, that's interesting. And sometimes the shots would be better with that. Sometimes they weren't. So I, I, I posted Diaspora about it. And um, I think there's some people who've taken this much further than I did with uh, modified blooming. So uh, I think it's worth doing a search on blooming and pressure, or I don't know what that would, would bring up those threads because people posted their modified bloomings with a pressure at the end um, or conditions. And I feel like there was something, there was, that was very fertile ground for improvement. We just, we didn't really nail it to a point where all of us had consensus and then we rolled it out as the standard. Um, so uh, Jonas has asked a question about uh, puck prep and, and uh, specifically about dosing. So um, I, even though I, you know, I'm a big fan of the niche, I really dislike dosing from the niche cup. And, and the reason is, is that you, you take your porta filter, you take your grounds, right? You do this and you flip. And then when you lift it, you've got a hillside. You always have a hillside. And you, you can do that, you can shake it, and then you've got a hillside with chaos. But you, you still have an incredibly uneven thing inside that. And, and um, coffee grounds are very light and fluffy and they compress very easily. And if you do a distribution into your puck, it looks like that. Um, this side here is going to be more compressed, I think, by the weight. Whatever the reason is, what I found is people who, who dump in like this and then fix it with WDT get worse shots than if you dose into the porta filter directly. There is an approach that I like a lot, and you can use the niche cup if you like the niche cup, which is instead of dumping, instead tap into the porta filter in a circular motion. Um, so that once you've dosed from your niche cup, you now have grounds that look good. But the, the cardinal rule, I would say, to uh, puck prep is less is more. So whatever you can do to do less fixing of your puck, the better your shot's going to be. So dumping grounds at an angle like this is going to make worse. Uh, it's going to require more fixing. It's going to make a worse shot. Now, I'm going to go further with that because um, Bugs was at this LA show and it was her first time uh, working with Rayo. And then she was the bar back and Rayo was not happy to have a uneducated assistant. But there's real value there because she didn't come with any assumptions. And so um, the way I dose with the niche is I use the portafilter stand and I put that in. And what I like about the niche is that it doesn't make a very tall volcano. In fact, the, the further you can get your porta filter from the output of any grinder, the less of a peak you're gonna get. And the less of a peak, the less work you have to do, the better it is, okay? Um, and um, so that's mine. And as we're all doing, that's what mine looked like, like that. And then I would use a rake to, to fix the top. So, but what Bugs did is she looked at that and she said, hmm, well, she didn't say anything. She went and did something which is uh, as the, the niche ground, she didn't use the portafilter stand at all. Instead, she held the portafilter under the niche and rotated it like this, so that when it finished grinding, it had been grinding into the corners in a circular motion. And her shots were consistently the best, better than Rayo's, better than mine. And, um, and uh, that was quite funny. Uh, and it's still the case that if she creates uh, if she does the puck prep for me and does it this way with the same profile, it, it comes out better. I can see it high as a higher peak pressure with more sustained uh, puck integrity. So the absolute best way I can tell you to make a, a coffee puck is to hold the pillow porta filter under the spout of the grinder and move it as it goes so that you end up with something that is just barely peaked, if at all. But um, I don't know how to you know, that's, that's a lot of work and not every grinder can do that. Um, yeah, you're getting quite a bit of a hill. You're on a niche. Um, so, you know, we sell two different porta filter stands, tall and a short one. The reason I recommend the short one, if you're using bottomless is because the farther away you are from the, um, 
the spout, the less of a, a volcano, a volcano you're going to get. Um, and in fact, I think if you look at the uh, mythos, it's clump crusher. I think that's what's causing it. Um, causes barely a peak, right? It's 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 this very small thing. Um, whereas ironically, the peak grinder gives you quite a peak. Uh, so I I think that might be one of the reasons actually the mythos makes good coffee as well is that the the grounds are more distributed inside the cordifilter dose. Uh, anything else, guys? Uh, I'm probably going to wrap it up shortly, unless anything else on the topic. Hey, John. Uh, Jaren here from uh, Dallas, Texas. Just got my niche a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I hate to ask this question, but what's your recommendation on testing water? Um, I've I've kind of gone down that path. I got an RO system installed. I'm trying to make my recipes, but um, I've bought pH test strips, I've bought a TDS meter, I've bought a digital pH meter. None of them really seem to be communicating the same message. Um, having read uh, Water for Coffee twice, so I could start to understand it. Um, you know, at, at the end of Water for Coffee, he has a chapter about water for trade shows. And, and the, the summary of the book is, oh my God, water is a disaster. So there, there's, there's only a few good answers to water for coffee. Uh, one is go buy bottled water that's good, right? Um, the other one is get a virtually pure water, either buy it or make it and then remineralize it. That's the Matt Perger Rayo approach. Um, I am not a fan of RO water because you don't necessarily end up with the minerals that are good. You just demineralize. Um, my feeling is if you have an RO system and you don't, you know, a cafe, um, RO to the max and then remineralize using the Brista Hustle recipe is going to get you the best tasting espresso. That's yeah, so I have, very I, short. I, I have, yeah, I have, I have tried some remineralization and the, the, the company that I bought my machine from had a remineralization cartridge as well. Um, so I've tried that out, but it, they're not really putting enough um, solid. And cartridge is not going to give you what you need. I mean, what you need to do is basically crank that RO system to give you virtually mineral-free water and then remineralize it based on actually water volume and weight of minerals um, so that you actually get the mineralization that you expect. The cartridge is... Anyway. Yeah, that, I'm that, that, kind of blending the cartridge with the uh, barista hustle uh, recipes. I think I was using... Um, uh, sure. Um, I would just go full whole hog barista hustle at that point. And the minerals that they're suggesting are so cheap. Yeah, um, and I've, I've got them already, so. Yeah, I mean, I know you bought the cartridge, you want to use it, uh, but that's about all. It's great for drinking about. water, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's proving to make coffee a, a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a very active diaspora water discussion. Um, but that's how I simplify it, is either buy water that's already suited or get demineralized water and remineralizing it according to the holy duo of water. Yeah, I'll probably pop that, that remineralization cartridge out and start just doing it myself. Aaron, do, do you uh, have do you have these kits? Uh, I, I do not. Is that, what's the name of it called? If, if you could drop it in the chat, I'll see if I can order a set. Yeah. Sure. Um, the, the reason why I'm holding this up is, I mean, it, it's got a resolution of about plus uh, like 15 ppm bands as calcium carbonate equivalents, but these kits are super cheap um, and the results are pretty consistent. So it's, it's a cheap way to get some information about what you're getting. I'll drop a link in the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. John, I had one more question for you. Um, Kind of around product availability. I had, I had ordered some stuff. It's kind of been uh, getting pushed back a couple times. Uh, the barista kit and the, the rake. Do you have a product update on those and what we might? Yeah. Um, the, so the milk jugs were just being tested yesterday. They're they're ready. Um, so they should ship in a day or two. That's what's holding up the. Um, it's just the milk jugs, isn't it? For the barista kits. Uh, the barista kits. Yeah. 
Well, we need cut rates and we need um, milk jugs. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the rest of the kits, it was just the milk jugs holding them up. So um, should just be, it should be next week. Um, I, I, I know we just got that. Um, and then the puck rake on the 12th, which is Thursday, I think, um, where my people are going to go to the factory it's making for us and we're doing the inspection. Um, so those should be pretty soon. Uh, the puck rake's been just a disaster because um, factories just don't want to make good stuff right now. And uh, I think that, I mean, the very short answer is I think because of COVID, people can't go to China to inspect manufacturing anymore. And so the factories, um, since they have a huge order book, just crank out low quality goods. And since we have the good luck of actually having our own people on salary in China showing up at the factories, we're considered annoying. Um, and, and we inspect every single one before it leaves the factory. Um, so that's why our stuff has been slow to come out because <laughs> we just keep getting all these WeChats about you are so demanding. Other clients are not so demanding. Um, you know, why won't you accept our poor quality? Um, so, well, I appreciate sorry. the attention to detail. That's yeah. That's sorry, it's just you know, once we have the merch and it's poor quality, everyone will forget the fact that it was late. Um, they'll just be unhappy with the poor quality. Um, so. That, that's kind of how it is. What I can tell you is um, that we're ordering much, much larger quantities than we ever have before. So once we get through this, uh, we're generally ordering four times more than we have. Um, and once we get through this, we'll have fewer stock problems. Um, so uh, there was a question that I'm kind of not gonna answer fully, which is what I think about uh, pressure pulsing which a certain company out there has advertised. Um, but I, I'll more generally answer that um, espresso machines through history have had a way of making espresso that was hardwired into the plumbing. And if you want to change the recipe, you change the plumbing. And if you have a pump that doesn't do variable speed, well, and all your competition's doing variable speed, well, you can just cycle it on and off and that will kind of have kind of the same effect. Um, so there's a company that's advertising pulse technology. And my feeling is it's a way to come up with variable flow without having to buy a um, pump with a gear on it. Pump with a gear on it would be the right way to solve that problem, I think. But um, I don't know anyone who's really used it or commented on it or done refractometer analysis. So and no one else has done pulse technology. So there you go. Um, okay, I am going to coffee. end the call because uh, we have not had coffee yet and Bugs wants coffee. So thanks everybody. And uh, this is gonna cut up uh, over the next few days and post it as more discreet things. Talk to you soon. Thanks, John. Hi, Bugs. Thank you.